Welcome. You are now beginning a tour of McCall Glacier and the research that goes on here. My name is Matt Nolan. I'm currently the lead scientist on the project, and for the next 20 minutes, I'll be your guide. I hope to give you a good idea about what's going on here and how to learn more on your own. Located in the pristine Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, McCall Glacier has been studied since the International Geophysical Year in 1957-58, when it was selected for long-term research. At the start of the International Polar Year in 2007, it will be 50 years since research began in McCall Glacier. This is the longest and most complete record of scientific research of any glacier in the U.S. Arctic. Let's begin the tour by taking a look at changes in the glacier over the past 50 years. Nearly 50 years ago, glaciologist Austin Post took this picture during IGY in 1958. In 2003, at the start of my project, I took the second picture shown here. As you can see, the glacier has lost a lot of ice and the terminus has retreated substantially, over 800 meters, or about half a mile. Such retreats occur when the rate of ice melt exceeds the rate of ice accumulation over extended periods and really can only be explained by a change in climate. The major emphasis of our research is explaining exactly how the climate caused the retreat seen in these pictures. We need to understand climate and climate change in the Arctic because even very small changes can trigger major feedbacks to the global climate system, such as through increasing sea level by glacier melt, increasing greenhouse gases by permafrost melt, and decreasing sea ice extent through warmer air and ocean temperatures. As you will see later in this presentation, McCall Glacier is one of our few hopes for understanding climate and climate change in this region of the Arctic. To answer these questions, we need to understand several things. The mass balance of the glacier, that is how much snow falls, melts, and turns into ice. The velocity field of the glacier, that is how ice from the upper regions of the glacier flows into the lower regions. The surface elevation of the glacier, the local climate, and perhaps most importantly, the long-term trends in these measurements. Let's explore each of these measurements, beginning with the mass balance. The mass balance of a glacier is just that, a balance of the mass. Mass in this case is the amount of snow and ice that makes up the glacier, and the balance records how much snow falls minus how much snow and ice melts. When this balance is positive, more snow fell in winter than melted in summer, and this excess eventually turns into ice and helps the glacier get thicker and longer. When this balance is negative, as it has been for the past 50 years at McCall Glacier, the glacier gets thinner and retreats. Snow melts last at highest elevation because it's colder there. The long-term zero balance point between the zones of ice accumulation and ice wastage is called the equilibrium line. The further down glacier the equilibrium line, the healthier the glacier is. We measure this balance by drilling stakes into the ice surface and then measuring how much they get buried or exposed over time. The labels you see here on the surface represent the stake network we currently use. In the interactive version of this tour, you can place the cursor over any of the labels and you will see how much of the stake was exposed above the surface at the time it was installed and how it changed a year later. In this case, the black labels are stakes from May 2003 and the red labels are from the same stakes in May 2004. If you were to click on any of the stakes, a spreadsheet that contains all of our measurements will appear in the tab labeled Message in the 3D container window. Here the area colored blue represents the region which historically has been gaining mass and the area colored red has been losing mass based on our mass balance measurements. From our long term records we have learned that the most positive year on record was 2002-2003 at just about zero balance, that is the blue area was roughly the same size as the red. The most negative year on record was in 2003-2004, the next year, with roughly negative one meters of ice loss averaged over the entire surface, that is the entire glacier was in the red zone. This huge short-term variability underscores the need for long-term measurements. The long-term trend we have thus far indicates the red zone is growing and doing so at the expense of the blue zone. It's quite possible that if trends continue that all of the glacier will remain in the red zone and begin rapidly melting away. As you may know, all glaciers flow downhill for essentially the same reasons that syrup flows down your pancakes. The basic idea is that the ice gets so thick that gravity causes it to deform under its own weight. Surface slope, ice thickness, and ice temperature largely control the speed of deformation. But glaciers can also slide along their base, just like an ice cube pushed across the table. By measuring the surface velocity field and using computer models, we can determine the relative proportion of deformation and sliding. Areas that are dominated by deformational flow move fastest near the center of the valley, whereas the areas that are sliding move roughly at the same speed across the entire width of the valley. Understanding where the glacier slides and deforms is necessary to predict the future behavior or understand previous behavior through computer modeling. We use the same stake network to measure surface velocity as we do to measure mass balance. To make these velocity measurements, we use high-resolution differential GPS, which has an accuracy of several centimeters. 
On this profile, you can see that the motion is primarily caused by deformation because the stakes near the center of the glacier move much further over a year than the stakes at the side. In this profile, you can see that the stakes near the edge of the glacier have moved almost as far as the stakes near the center. This strongly suggests that the glacier is sliding here. We find this interesting because it implies that the glacier is not frozen to its bed here. That is, the ice temperature near the surface of the glacier is about minus 10 degrees C, whereas near the bottom it must be about 0 degrees C, else the ice would be frozen to the rock underneath. Glaciers with variable temperatures like this are called polythermal glaciers, to distinguish them from temperate glaciers, which are 0 degrees C everywhere, and cold glaciers, which are below 0 degrees C everywhere. Most cold glaciers exist in Antarctica or Greenland. We measure surface elevation of the glacier over time because from this we can directly quantify how much ice the glacier has gained or lost. This information is complementary to, but independent of, our mass balance measurements, allowing us to check our accuracies on both techniques. We measure surface elevation in three ways. First, we measure the elevation of the top of the stakes you've already seen. If we subtract this from the exposed pull height, we can calculate the surface elevation. Second, we have several cross-flow transects that we return to over time and repeat measurements there. The two transects shown here were first measured in the 1960s. When we measured the closest one in 2003, after a 10-year gap, we found that there was no ice left here. The terminus had retreated back beyond the transect. Over 60 meters of ice has melted away since measurements began here, and not enough ice was formed up glacier to resupply it. Thus the terminus began to retreat. The third method that we use to measure surface elevation involves flying a small plane low above the ice. Inside the airplane is a GPS and a laser altimeter. The GPS lets us know where the plane is, and the laser tells us exactly how high it is above the ice. By subtracting the two, we calculate the surface elevation. The last time this was done in McCall Glacier was in 1993. Since then, starting in 2003, every May and August we measure surface elevations along the same profile, but by skiing or walking while carrying the GPS inside a backpack. Since we're already here to measure mass balance using our stake network, it's more convenient to measure the transect on the ground rather than with the plane. One of the reasons we know so little about climate change in this region is that there is only one weather station within 100 miles of the glacier, and it only operated sporadically over the past 50 years. There are other, more reliable weather stations even further away, but their applicability here is questionable, largely because of their proximity to the coast and the peculiar weather dynamics this causes. Because the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge is maintained as a pristine wilderness area, there are no other long-term weather stations here. Only because of McCall Glacier's history of research, which predates the formation of the refuge, are we allowed to make measurements here. Thus, McCall Glacier is the only location within this region of the Arctic that we are able to directly measure climate and climate trends. In the 1957-58 IGY project, weather measurements were made by hand in the upper cirque of McCall Glacier by human data loggers. Some of these measurements extend through part of that winter, as there was a winter camp established. These measurements were made during the earliest days of modern glaciology, at the time when we were just beginning to understand how ice flows and how climate and glaciers interact. In the 1969-1973 project, weather measurements were made by automated analog data loggers. Due to the harsh climate here, where mean annual air temperature is about minus 10 degrees C and the wind speeds can exceed 100 miles per hour, this equipment only recorded for a few weeks at a time when no one was around to maintain them. In the 1990s, measurements of air temperature and snow melt were made at several locations using automated digital data loggers for the first time. Several of these stations recorded continuously for several years. In 2003, we began installing a number of automated digital weather stations, complete with wind speeds, air temperatures, relative humidity, barometric pressure, solar radiation, ice melt, and ice temperatures. These stations have been running continuously since May 2003, and to lemoning the data hourly to the internet so that we can see what's going on from the comfort of our own living rooms or lecture halls. Air temperatures vary widely over the glacier, partly because air temperatures tend to get colder with increased elevation. That's why snow lasts longer at the top of mountains than the bottom. Therefore, to capture these differences, we install weather stations at many elevations and several heights at each location. In total, we now have about 12 stations installed and running. Several of these were placed at the same locations as previous measurements to facilitate comparisons with them. But air temperatures also vary vertically just above the glacier surface because the surface of the glacier is never warmer than 0 degrees C, but at head level the air temperature may be 10 degrees C in summer. Thus, we often install air temperature sensors at several heights at each location so that we can better understand this gradient. So what have we learned thus far from all these measurements? 
We use the velocity measurements in a finite difference computer model to conclusively show that the surface speeds we measure cannot be explained by cold ice deformation alone. This model indicates that a temperate layer of ice must exist near the base of the glacier. However, there's no way that such a temperate layer could have formed in the current climate. It must have formed in a previous climate when the ice was much thicker, insulating the bottom of the ice from the chilly winter air. This is one piece of evidence that the climate has changed here recently, and our modeling suggests that this change began occurring at least 100 years ago. This research was led by Dr. Frank Patton at the Free University of Brussels in Belgium. The surface elevation measurements told us that the rate of ice loss from a cold glacier is increasing with time. This plot is from a cross profile and shows the average rate of surface elevation change over the past 100 years or so. The date of the oldest point, 1890, comes from evidence provided by lichens, which indicate approximately when the retreat began. The elevation in 1890 was determined by the height of the moraines located around the margin of the glacier. Though care needs to be taken when interpreting data like this, it is quite likely representative of the entire glacier and roughly representative of all glaciers in this region. Changes in ice volume like this can only be explained by one thing, a change in climate. That is, sometime in the late 1800s, some aspect of climate change that caused this volume loss. The most likely candidate is an increase in air temperature, but a decrease in precipitation or a change in cloudiness may also have played a role. And because the rate of ice loss is unambiguously continuing to increase, it means that climate is continuing to change here as well. To better understand the interactions between climate change and glacier change, we are beginning to use our weather station data within models to understand the surface energy balance. In a first step towards this, Dr. Lisette Klock at Utrecht University in the Netherlands analyzed data from the summer of 2004. Here we learned that we could adequately model the full surface energy balance of the glacier and that solar radiation, or the amount of sunshine, was responsible for about 75% of the snow and ice melt. A full sensitivity analysis was conducted that lets us know which of our measurements may be introducing the most error in our calculations. The next step in this research is to use these spatially distributed surface energy balance models to inform much simpler degree day models that also incorporate shading of the valley walls. Using this model, we will be better able to understand what combinations of temperature and precipitation might lead to thicker or thinner glaciers over time. In closing, it's important to note that the size of glaciers throughout the world has been varying continuously for millions of years. Out beyond the foothills of the Brooks Range, where McCall Glacier now lies, is clear evidence that much larger glaciers once dominated this landscape. It's likely that over 100,000 years ago, the moraines seen here today were filled with ice striving to reach the coast. What the future holds for the glaciers in this region is unclear, but if current climate trends continue, the accelerating rate of ice loss that we've noticed over the past 100 years will surely continue to accelerate, and perhaps 100 years from now, the McCall Glacier Valley will be filled with meadows, caribous, and butterflies rather than ice. This concludes the tour. I hope that you have enjoyed it and that you will continue to explore this fascinating region of the Arctic on your own.